What do you see on your screen? At this close range, the picture looks like nothing more than a random collection of dots, a jumble of odd shapes. Nothing in the picture seems to be related. It has no meaning. But now we will begin to draw away from the picture and then look at it again. What difference do you see? Viewed from a deeper, different perspective, the picture suddenly loses its abstract quality. The dots merge and take on definite, recognizable forms. The picture is no longer a shapeless jumble. Suddenly it has meaning. It is a face, the face of Jesus Christ. Hello, I'm Father Michael Tuith. Welcome to What Catholics Believe About Jesus Christ. These are the Marianist galleries. Most of this abstract artwork is the creation of Brother Mel Meyer of St. Louis. It's sort of appropriate since we'll be dealing with a lot of abstract ideas, but we hope that by the end of the program, Jesus Christ will have a concrete meaning in your life. For it is Jesus Christ alone who gives meaning to our faith. He is its living center. Everything we believe takes its meaning from him. Our faith, then, is not faith in a list of separate and distinct abstract truths. Our faith is in the living person of Jesus Christ. Some people say that Jesus Christ was a holy man and a great religious teacher, Nothing less, nothing more. What do you believe? I believe that. People said. I certainly believe he was more than that. Jesus Christ was a holy man and a great teacher of truth. I believe it. No. I, he, he was God. There had been prophets and teachers in the past with a message to proclaim, but none of them had demanded belief in himself. Jesus, however, slowly and gradually revealed to his disciples that he was much more than a teacher, much more than a messenger, much more than a prophet. The gospel accounts of Jesus found in the Bible are meant to convey what is beyond history, that God became human in Jesus Christ. God's innermost life in which three persons remaining completely unique our in total union of love is called the Incarnation, Covenant, Trinity, or Grace. If you answered Trinity, you're correct. Now, true or false, the teaching that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was first given to us by the Apostles. True or false? The Apostles first taught that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, yes, true. False. No, I think Jesus thought that. True. The answer is true. As Jews of their day, the apostles believed in one God, the God of their ancestral fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Jesus was the first to speak of them of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus was their Lord and God. Mysteriously, God was one. God was three, and God was Jesus. These teachings only made sense to the apostles in light of the resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit. And they preached it vigorously after the Spirit's coming. This uniqueness, this mystery of the Trinity, is best expressed as three divine natures in one person, three persons in three divine natures, three persons in one divine nature, or three divine natures in three persons. Three persons in one divine nature? Three divine natures in one person. I'm not really quite sure about that one. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. This can get confusing. The answer is three persons in one divine nature. The phrase three persons in one divine nature expresses a mystery we cannot fully understand. But like the image of the shamrock with three leaves on one stem, we can gain some insight into it. 
The word person refers to who we are. If someone asks us, what are you? We respond that we are human, our nature. If someone asks us, who are you? We respond with our name, person. With humans, there is only one person in each human nature. But God is three persons in one nature. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three separate and divine persons, but not three separate gods. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal, divine, and exist from all eternity. God wants to draw us into this marvelous life. We are destined to spend eternity with the Trinity, and this heaven begins here on earth when we know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But how do we come to know God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, the same way the apostles did. The principal way God communicates himself to us is through his presence in Jesus. This communication is called faith, belief, revelation, or infallibility. Faith, I think. This is faith that Christ lives in each one of us. Uh, infallibility. The answer is revelation. What do we mean when we say that Jesus reveals God to us? Do we mean that because Jesus comes from God, he can give us inside information we could not otherwise get? That's not quite the picture the Gospels reveal to us. That's not the way Jesus speaks of himself. He says, I am the truth. Not I speak the truth or I reveal the truth, but I am the truth. There is a relationship in God's being which we can best understand as Father, Son. Then the New Testament teaches that the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became human. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Christ's human nature gives us our truest insights into the nature of God. Christmas, one of the favorite times of the year for Catholics. In Catholic teaching, the Son of God becoming a man is called the presentation, incarnation, redemption, or visitation. Presentation. Incarnation. Redemption, isn't it? Incarnation. Yeah. The answer is incarnation. The Bible shows us that Jesus was a real down-to-earth human being. He was raised in a small town. He was so normal that when he came back as a teacher and a miracle worker, people refused to believe he was special. He was enough of a boy to go off on his own and get lost at the age of 12. He observed life and he loved nature. He celebrated life. He was courageous, but he knew fear. He was born like us and he experienced death just as we all will. Which of the following biblical quotations best describes the human nature of Jesus Christ? The Father and I are one. He was like us in all things except sin. I have not called you servants but friends. Or he went away once more and prayed. He was like us in all things except sin. The Father and I are one. I don't know. The answer is... He was like us in all things except sin. Jesus liked people, and people liked him. He was always getting invited to meals, and he enjoyed being with those people. He cared about little children and often noticed people that others missed. To him, elderly widows and despised sinners were very important. Jesus was also a compassionate man. He once defended a woman accused of adultery, and he shed tears at the death of his friend Lazarus. He wept over the fate of Jerusalem. Jesus was, and always is, a friend. 
Earlier, we said that nature refers to what we are. According to Catholic teaching, in Jesus, there are two natures, two persons, two natures, one person, two persons, one nature, or one person, one nature. I say one person, one nature. <laughs> <laughs> Two natures, one person. That's sounds... One person, one nature. The answer is two natures, one person. Some have denied that Jesus was truly God. Others have denied that he was truly human. The Catholic Church has always taught that Jesus is truly divine and truly human. The Church explains that Jesus has a divine nature and a human nature united in one divine person, the Word. We cannot understand how Jesus can be both God and a human being, but we believe it because Jesus worked miracles and because miracles still occur in his name. We believe it because Jesus rose from the dead and in his victory over death, we see the presence of God. It wasn't only by miracles that Jesus caught the attention of people. He also mesmerized his audiences with his tremendous ability to storytell and his compassionate insight into people's relationships with God and with each other. As the gospel says, he taught with authority. One of these teachings is the Beatitudes. Yes or no is blessed are those who seek wisdom and live by it a Beatitude? No, it's not. Yes. I think so. I think so, yes. No. The answer is no, but it's still pretty good advice. But you'll be wiser about Jesus' teachings of the Beatitudes when you listen to this. In strong contrast to the moral climate of his days, Jesus taught a morality of the heart. Jesus was more concerned with the inner spirit than he was with external actions. To Jesus, the internal motive, the heart, is of primary importance. External actions obviously have their own importance, but their real morality must be judged according to the motivation from which they spring. Those who do the right thing, but for the wrong motives, such as pride, human respect, public reputation, have not yet internalized the teaching of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is a pattern for living that is psychologically and spiritually sound. Healthy, self-esteem, generous love for others, belief in God as the origin and the goal of life. We know from Scripture that many people of Jesus' time misinterpreted his mission. Even those who came to the conclusion that Jesus was the Messiah didn't think of that role as a spiritual one. The majority thought he had come to establish an earthly kingdom, as witnessed by their Palm Sunday Jerusalem celebration. Others, like the political zealots of the time, thought he would militarily crush the hated Roman occupiers. The Gospels also record that Jesus himself was tempted to be a false messiah. Here's a question for you. The tempter is depicted as trying to get Jesus to manifest his power prematurely by changing water into wine, curing the centurion's son, multiplying the loaves and fishes, or turning stones into bread? All of them. Turn stones into bread when he's in the desert. Turn stones into bread. The answer is turning stones into bread. In a way, it's reassuring to know that Jesus was subject to temptation. It somehow emphasizes his humanity. Though we know by faith that he is truly man as well as truly God, don't most of us hesitate to think of him as really human? And even though most people misunderstood Jesus and many plotted against him, he refused to use his miraculous power to crush his foes, relying only on love to call them to repentance. Yet he did experience a struggle, and he had to reaffirm his complete acceptance of the Father's will. In Catholic teaching, Jesus is dying, rising, and sending of the Spirit to continue forever with God's people is called the Paschal Mystery, Pentecost, Ascension, or Theism. Ascension, the Paschal Mystery. 
Paschal Mystery? The answer is the Paschal Mystery. The Paschal Mystery gets its name from the identification of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection with the Passover, or Paschal Meal of the Old Testament, commemorating the exodus from Egypt. The freedom obtained by the chosen people from Pharaoh allowing them to leave behind slavery is, in the light of the New Testament, a foreshadowing of Jesus' passing from the darkness and slavery of death to the light and freedom of life. A second century Greek homily puts it this way, For born sun-like, and led forth lamb-like, and slaughtered sheep-like, and buried man-like, he is risen God-like, being by nature God and man. Jesus is given many titles in Catholic thought. Which of these refers to Jesus' redeeming of the human condition? The new Adam, the new Moses, the new Caesar, or the Messiah? For me, he's the new man. When he died and he came resurrection, he's the new man. The old man was Adam, the new man, just The Messiah. The Messiah. The Messiah. I bet I caught you on this one. The answer is the new Adam. Just as sin was sown into the world through the sin of Adam, so Jesus has conquered sin by his passion, death, and resurrection. The seeds of a new life in Jesus have now been sown in us. Of course, our full and complete union with Christ will not be achieved until we, like him, have passed from this world to the next. But salvation has already begun. Our task here and now is to foster its growth so that even on this earth we become more and more like Jesus. True or false, in the Gospels on the third day after Jesus' death, his tomb was first found to be empty by the women. True or false? True. True. False. The ladies, the women, of course. The answer is true. Scripture scholars see this as another way the gospel writers were weaving together the story of the fall with the redeeming actions of Christ. Just as it was through the misadventures of Adam and Eve that humankind first lost favor with God, so it was through the triumphant new Adam, Jesus, that our relationship with God was restored. And the first people to find the tomb empty after the resurrection, after the establishment of this new life, were the women, the new Eves. Our redemption was now complete. The freeing of people from sin and its effects in and through Christ is called salvation, glorification, inspiration, or transfiguration. Salvation. Transfiguration. Salvation. The answer is salvation. In his person, the Son of God, by overcoming death through his own death and resurrection, saved or redeemed us and changed us into a new creation. By communicating his spirit to us, Christ has mystically constituted as his body every person who has ever lived, past, present, and future. In that body, the life of Christ is communicated to those who believe by baptism. They are united in a hidden and real way to Christ in his passion, death, and resurrection. Even though Jesus was to ascend into heaven, he told the apostles that he would remain with them. The reality of his presence is shown in scripture through a cloud, Christ's ascension, or the expression at God's right hand. The reality of Jesus. Hmm. I would say um, reality of Jesus is shown as the word of God, but uh, at God's right hand, I guess. He is shown at God's right hand, but he's also shown ascending and on a cloud and all of those different things. At God's right hand, or at God's right hand. The answer is all three. Jesus promised to be with his followers, then departed. Now, how could this be? 
the cloud, the ascension, and the expression at God's right hand are meant to show that Jesus is truly Lord and God, in other words, no longer limited by space or time. Jesus was not taken away. He is where God is everywhere. As Catholics pray at the conclusion of the Eucharistic prayer at Mass, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. All of the following stories about Jesus are post-resurrectional accounts of Jesus' appearances to his disciples, except the road to Emmaus, the shore of Tiberias, the calming of the waves, or the doubting Thomas. Uh, calming of the waves. It was the calming of the waters that came before the resurrection. The doubting Thomas. The answer is the calming of the waves. The purpose of these post-resurrectional stories is to have the Christian community ask itself, now that Jesus has gone to the Father, where do I see him in my life? Where do I touch Jesus today? And of course the answer is that we see and touch Jesus in the ongoing life of the community in the sight and touch of brothers and sisters as we journey down the road together, breaking the bread of the Eucharist, sharing fellowship along the shore of life, sometimes doubting, but always faith-filled and ready, like Thomas, to proclaim to Jesus when we recognize him, my Lord and my God. Besides the Lord's Day, Christmas, and the Easter Triduum, the church celebrates other special moments in Jesus' life. These are variously ranked as holy days, solemnities, or feasts. True or false, the Good Shepherd is one of them. False. False. I think I may have caught you on this one, too. Although we easily identify with this comforting Good Shepherd image of Jesus and the gospel is read during the church year, the answer is false. The Good Shepherd does not have its own feast day. The feasts of the Lord in their order of celebration, according to the church's calendar, which begins on the first Sunday of Advent, are Epiphany, Presentation of the Lord, Trinity Sunday, Corpus Christi, or the Body of Christ, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Transfiguration, the Triumph of the Cross, and Christ the King. We hope you've begun to learn much about Jesus in your life, and we hope we've been of some help in that search. St. Paul had a way with words. In his letter to the Philippians, he said what's in all our hearts about Jesus. All I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death in the hope that I myself will be raised from death to life. As we leave now, it might be good to quote from John's Gospel the words Jesus spoke to his disciples shortly before he ascended into heaven. In these words, Jesus promises us his unending presence in the world and in our lives by sending us his spirit. I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. That spirit of truth whom the world can never receive since it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him because he is with you. He is in you. I have said these things to you while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all I have said to you. When the Advocate comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who issues from the Father, he will be my witness, and you too will be witnesses because you have been with me from the outset. It is for your own good that I am going, because unless I go, 
the advocate will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. He will glorify me, since all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. Everything the Father has is mine. That is why I said, all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. Thank you.